Welcome to Reporter's Notebook, where we talk to the Washington Examiner's top journalists about the stories breaking on their beats. I'm Jim Antle. I'm joined today by Supreme Court reporter Kaylin Deese. Kaylin, what's going on in Georgia? Obviously, there's been this investigation of how the 2020 election was handled. A former president, Donald Trump, wanted a different result. He was allegedly pressuring people to produce, to find that result. They say it was a perfect phone call. What's sort of the status of the case right now? So the case kind of, well, I guess we shouldn't call it a case, but it's right. mainly an investigation. Sure. Got really weird this week whenever a foreperson for the 26-member grand jury that was composed for this investigation came out and did a media tour and went to all the mainstream outlets almost. And basically kind of, her, her name is Emily Coors, and she mm -hmm. basically was kind of giving these indications that perhaps maybe a dozen people uh, out of this group of 75 witnesses could be uh, facing future indictments mm -hmm. uh, based on her recommendations. And again, this is a, uh, a grand jury that can only make recommendations to right. prosecutors. Mm -hmm. So what was even weirder about that is that she seemed to also hint that perhaps Trump himself could allegedly be on the list. Sure. And that was just through sort of subtle gestures of, you know, like it's not rocket science, you mm -hmm. know, saying things like that to interviewers in the media. And on top of that, uh, in conservative circles, uh, she was met with a lot of skepticism just based off of, you know, sort of superficial, you know, like facial movements and suggestions. And, you know, this, this uh, CORE's person really kind of just blew up a lot of people's perspectives about this investigation because you have a lot of, um, I would say, uh, more liberal-leaning attorneys who are going out and saying, why are you talking to the media about these closed contact you sure. know, grand jury probes that are th th that's happening? And so I, I, I think that for the most part, people have looked at this and seen her comments and say, get off the airwaves because, you know, the uh, prosecutor that is looking at potential uh, indictments and uh, in, in, uh, following this this investigation has basically asked the judge uh, to not really give that much information at all about the witnesses that were interviewed because she wants this to be a very uh, closed off vacuum sealed situation in case there are potential defendants uh, and so do people think that this could have a real impact on whether certain people get indicted whether anybody's prosecuted will it affect the investigation in some tangible way that's a great question I have spoken to a couple of different attorneys about this matter, and they've mm -hmm. told me that while they think that uh, Coors comments were highly inappropriate and they shouldn't have been said, uh, and maybe went a little bit too close to the line of what is uh, considered um, making this uh, appear nonpartisan, mm -hmm. they have essentially uh, implied that there's nothing that could be taken away thus far what Coors has said to completely jeopardize uh, any potential prosecutions, but at the very least, it does make it look more partisan, uh, you know, from, I think, any perspective, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, it definitely doesn't look good whenever you have someone going on the airwaves kind of almost rooting for potential indictments, even mm -hmm. even indictments for the former pre pre president, so. Could throw the entire investigation off course. Yeah, definitely off course and definitely gives it <laughs> some of that, you know, uh, partisan kind of slant, you know? Sure. So the Supreme Court and Big Tech, obviously we have the justices hearing some cases. What's going on? What do, you, what do you find most interesting in terms of some things that are upcoming on that front? Right. So we heard two cases this week, mm -hmm. uh, one that was against Google and one that was against Twitter, and they both had to deal with uh, anti terror laws in the U.S., mm -hmm. but the first case argued this week, Google, Google v. Gonzalez also had to do with Section 230 of the mm -hmm. Communications Decency Everybody's Act. Everybody's favorite provision of that act. Right. right. Everyone, basically the only one that matters. You right. Know? And uh, essentially, you know, it's one that, as we know thus far, gives uh, tech platforms large uh, immunity, mm -hmm. uh, basically from being sued for uh, third-party users posting on their platforms. So. And these cases sort of test that. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And what we could sort of come away with after the Gonzalez arguments on Tuesday mm -hmm. were that the justices did not seem completely convinced that this immunity that we've known since 1996 is 
should be just like all out immunity. Mm -hmm. Now, the liability, you know, question there is, you know, we don't want, and obviously people don't want to be censored because companies like Google and Facebook, Meta, are worried about being sued for the users' posts on their platform. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue in all this, and you've seen a lot of big tech companies and lobbyists kind of had this altruistic, you know, sort of perspective saying, we want to look out for the users on our platforms. We don't want anything to lead to more mass censorship because we don't want to be held liable for, you know, someone saying, you know, X statement on a platform. So, and it's a big threat to their business models. First Amendment implications and all of the rest of it aside. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah, it's basically their lifeline for advertisement too. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing a lot of lobbyists in Washington saying, "Hey, Supreme Court justices, please, whatever you do with this case, do not." touch Section 230 because mm -hmm. it could upend the internet as we know it. And I think that for the most part, um, what is being expressed is going to go down the line of where will the justices cl seek to clarify these anti-terrorism laws. Mm -hmm. Because these cases were brought by family members of people who allege that Google's algorithms and Twitter's algorithms are causing or, or, or led to an ISIS attack that killed their loved ones. So right. it's a very serious matter, but at mm -hmm. the same time, it's kind of hard to make the argument, right, that you know a algorithm, you know, subsequently led to this type of attack. It's mm -hmm. it's kind of a really hard argument to you know buy into, and most people would kind of agree to that. So I think that what we saw from the justices' response could just result perhaps in some clarifications on the U.S.'s current anti-terror laws mm -hmm. and perhaps how those anti-terror laws apply to social media. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as Section 230 goes, I think that we'll have to wait at least until 2024 to hear anything about potential changes to that because we are seeing currently in lower courts lawsuits that are uh, over Texas social media laws mm -hmm. which uh, are trying to prevent uh, big tech from basically censoring anyone with certain political viewpoints right. and you have a Florida social media law which is basically saying you can't ban politicians mm -hmm. off of social media so those are two separate laws that I think are gonna get more into the weeds because it's talking about like a patchwork you know like how is Texas going to impose different rules for Facebook uh, and how is Florida gonna ro impose different rules you know that don't necessarily correspond to the rest of the you know 48 states so I think that that is going to be something where Section 230 gets brought up again, and perhaps the Supreme Court could agree to take up those cases in their 2023-24 term. So finally, how does underlying tech knowledge, technical knowledge, influence any of this? I mean, the Supreme Court justices, there are a couple of younger ones on there now, but they don't really strike me as big tweeters and big YouTubers. Does that matter? Uh, I think it does matter. I think that you saw that on display whenever Justice Elena Kagan, a liberal justice, said, openly admitted that we're not tech experts. Mm -hmm. And it was her and also Justice Brett Kavanaugh, a conservative justice, that were both repeating this line saying, why don't we just give this back to Congress? Why don't we let Congress try to you know, clarify these questions here? Because that's a bunch of youths who are clearly pretty wired and on very online. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have you know people like Josh Hawley and mm -hmm. you know Chuck Grassley. Obviously, he's older, but you know those are the firebrands who are actually kind of you know pushing against some of Section 230. Which, you know, from the conservative angle of criticis criticizing Section 230, they are worried about having their viewpoints censored online. Mm -hmm. From the Democratic side of criticizing Section 230, they're worried that tech companies often leave up too much extreme content. So mm -hmm. it's different angles for criticizing 230, and I think that you have a lot of firebrands in Congress who would like to you know, approach this issue more nuanced. You know, they have a lot more members, a lot more people who study this stuff you know, mm -hmm. day after day. The justices, they're always on to the next case. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we see them you know, make recommendations of you know, maybe this is an issue for Congress to address. Mm -hmm. That refrain was repeated time and time again, especially by Kagan and Kavanaugh, and it seems like they would prefer Congress to address 230. Maybe morning in America, but on the internet it's always 230. Thank you, Kalen. You can read Kalen and the rest of our policy team's coverage at WashingtonExaminer.com.